this is the next session, uh, Reopening with Confidence. So we've got George Vaughan, Head of Technology from Ascot Racecourse, Mark Kelly, Managing Director of Ashton Gate Stadium, Matt Roberts, Head of Research and Analytics at Formula One, uh, and Robert Fitzpatrick, the CEO of the Odyssey Trust. Um, and Robert, I'm sure will tell you on this panel session, he's also involved with the Arena Resilience uh, Alliance. Uh, so he'll be telling you more about that. And the whole session is going to be moderated uh, by Mike Bondiak, Managing Director of PTI Digital. So, right, I'll let you uh, fire ahead then, Mike. I'll leave it in your capable hands. No problem. Thanks very much, Katie, and, uh, and thanks everyone uh, for, for joining in today. Um, I'll just do a brief introduction to the session and then to the panellists within it. Uh, so yeah, today we're, um, we're talking about reopening with confidence. Uh, and We'll be taking a look uh, from a variety of lenses, uh, including from the venue operator, uh, where technology plays the role, uh, the fans and the customers themselves, and then some of the wider social drivers uh, that the world is now waking up to and things that we're considering as venues as we as we start to reopen. Uh, just to, to reintroduce uh, for those who just joined, uh, I'm Mike Bondi, founder CEO at PTI Digital. Uh, I'm delighted to have a, a stellar panel uh, alongside me today. Uh, Mark Kelly, uh, Managing Director at Ashton Gate Stadium and Bristol Sports. Uh, George Vaughan, Head of Technology at Ascot. Uh, Robert Fitzpatrick, CEO at the Odyssey Trust. Uh, we're awaiting Matt Roberts, uh, Research and Analytics Director uh, from Formula One. So welcome to all of the uh, panellists today and thanks for uh, thanks for taking the time out. Uh, so to get us underway um, and start thinking about things, I guess from a venue operator's point of view and, and Mark, from your perspective, uh, it'd be interesting just to hear um, from your side, just on the steps taken and some of the work that's happening behind the scenes from a, a, a safety point of view and, and your plans from Ashton Gate Stadium on the, on the safe return of fans to venues. Yeah, thanks, Mike, and, uh, and thanks for having me today. Um, what we're doing, I suppose, from a safety, but just from a uh, generic point of view, we're, we're planning for, um, rightly or wrongly, we're, re we're planning for a return of full fans um, back from late summer, August, September. So we're, we're starting from sort of top up, assuming that we'll get our 27,000 capacity back in um, from September. So we think that's the easiest way to do it, to be able to plan around the large crowds um, Dave Storr, who's the head of safety and security, is um, planning the logistics. It, it is, it's going to be ultimately different. What we're expecting, first and foremost, is a spike of crowds to come back, probably out of curiosity and interest. And actually then commercially, which you can come back to maybe Mike in a few minutes, that, that may dip down and, and be good to talk about what we're trying to do to keep an eye on that. Um, but from a safety point of view, obviously the logistics has changed. We were going to introduce safe standing um, this season or uh, an area of safe standing which we decided not to do now because it is it's we feel that everyone's going to need a seat or at least a dedicated uh, seat to cooperate with track and trace so we need to know who is coming into the into the stadium where they're sat um, where they're coming from so if there's any type of out, out, you know, outbreaks we, we can track it um, and just really understanding from a, a fan point of view their own journey so where do they come from do they come from Bristol do they come outside of Bristol and they've had a spike in any areas are there any areas that are under control as we get into the autumn and to understand how we manage the, the accessibility not just from the main entrance on, on Ashton Road but from, from home I suppose to, to their seat um, and we're, we're, we're trying to do that with obviously through tech and, and through just the, the information that we hold on a season card and demographic information that we hold on, on the fan season card. So I think the journey starts from the home then as you get into the courses and concessions. We're lucky that the stadium is, is fairly new in comparison to other old stadiums. We, we developed back in 2014 and 2015. So we are blessed with a large amount of facility within the concourse area, wide concourse, you know, many toilets. But again, we're looking through the ratio to see to make sure we have that correct and we have that right. And is it right like we do in a concert when we have um, a different demographic, we put facilities out in the car park so we can spread the load so we're, we're really just looking, um, I suppose to answer your question, we're looking at a return of, of instantly high, high numbers, um, but under the operational logistics of, of a social distance event and, and what that means. 
And George, picking up on that uh, and Mark's point on the technology side of it, with your lens at, uh, at Ascot, how is, how is technology playing a role in, in your confidence in reopening plans? Uh, well, I think, you know, obviously we're looking just like everybody else at the phase return of customers. Um, and that, that does present us with challenges, but also opportunities when we're looking at using technology. So we've been focusing on the development of different tech anyway in, in post, uh, sorry, pre-pandemic. Uh, so NFC digital ticketing is a big one for us, um, looking at how we can actually encourage more people to use that as a mechanism for entry, because then we can do things like staggered arrival times. Um, you know, I personally, I'm a big advocate of look at what retail is doing um, because it's one of the sectors that has been operational during the pandemic in some form or other. Uh, and I personally think that, you know, we should evolve our estates and encourage people to understand that in time, they can only come through our turnstiles if they have a digital ticket. And if they're only prepared to dispense with cash and look at other mechanisms like contactless technology. So that's another area that the, we, we, we want to push further. Uh, contactless payments are going to rise again, aren't they, to, to, to £100 through a traditional card. Uh, but anybody that's used Apple Pay or Google Pay will know that there's no ceiling limit on that. So we'd, we'd be looking to push that. We've been working with our POS provider capture and also third party app companies like Real Life Tech uh, to, to offer safer ways for our customers when they are back on site to order and pay for their food and drinks. So we'll be pushing things like order to the table and, and click and collect. Uh, and then we're also looking at mechanisms through our comms like cellular, Wi-Fi and, and our apps to better be able to inform people um, when they do come back on site. Because it, it's obvious that at the start, demand is going to outstrip um, availability in terms of numbers on site. Uh, so yeah, so there's, there's a number of areas that we're looking at, stuff that we'd had already been working on, but I think now there's an opportunity to escalate that um, for the future. And Roberts, um, uh, in, in your world, we've, talk, we've talked here particularly about the consumers and how fans uh, themselves and customers will actually react. And uh, as George was sort of alluding to there, um, yeah, the wider world has changed in terms of how people have adopted things like cashless uh, and, and wider pieces. From your point of view, there's obviously a drive around a wider sort of social change uh, programme. How do you think that some of those drivers may influence fans and, and their desire to return to stadia and to, and to venues? Thanks, mate. Great question. Um, I suppose we're quite lucky in Belfast because we were uh, we started on the digital journey five years ago. So we we invested. I mean, the truth be told, we were lifestyle first customer before they ever went to real tech. So we're completely used to the whole idea of using our app to generate our incomes. I mean, we're operating off at, at before the pandemic struck. We're operating at something like you know, 41% of food and beverage sales was sitting on an app prior to the, prior to the arrival. Um, and we've been, we've invested very heavily in the whole customer experience perspective. And we've invested very ha happily, heavily in the employee context within the customer experience. So for me, the, the two big changes that I think that's common, and we've, we, we tried to sort of map this in, a, in an algorithm that was really around the ideas of what's going to be the new mandatory expectation. You know, what are we going to be forced to comply with and what are we going to have to introduce to get some sort of marketer or some sort of enhanced marketer that enhances your customer experience? Now, it, it comes down to me to two very simple things. There's a lot of companies have spent a lot of money so far in the how space, in the how they're going to do these things, and that's laudable. But there's too few companies have asked why they're doing it without there being a very clear direction around the return on the investment that they're making at this stage. So, so for me, within the mandatory expectation process, um, I think that the new pressure that's going to come on is going to be around, is there any correlation between the confidence of reopening with big crowds and sustainable practice and the, the practice of embracing new sustainable methods of, of how you do things? I completely agree with George in that, you know, um, the currency of cashless, the currency of, of, of uh, apps, all of that sort of stuff, we've been there, we're there, I'm fully on board with that. The thing for me that's going to be um, the next game changer, and it comes back to Mark's uh, very, very salient point about tickets, whoever can crack the code of either putting the responsibility of the piece of work that needs to be done 
to secure swift entrance into your facility, back on the person. The rivers can secure the way where they kick your app down, they bolt it onto your venue app, and that it's the responsibility of the person to make sure that if they've got the compliant platform um, secured within their own sort of GDPR space, they can get the quick evidence. If they haven't got that, they've got to join the queue because there aren't going to be a circumstance where the likes of insurance companies and any people that mitigate for that are certainly are going to look at a profile where you simply open the door and let people come without any sense of personal or public responsibility on what's going to happen here. And it will only take one super spreader event, one, where all the high money that's been invested will suddenly, it'll not matter because the super spreader will close everything back down again because it hasn't really been thought through where you sit the personal responsibility for coming to an event healthy. I think that's a, that's a fascinating point around the risk of um, from the reopening point of view. And I guess it comes a bit down to the split of the confidence of us as venue operators and people working in the industry versus the confidence of the fans and the spectators and other people who are actually returning. Um, I mean, Mark, from your point of view, what's what's been the, the, the focus of the, the campaign across the Bristol Sport Group for generating that consumer confidence in, in the venue uh, from a consumer lens rather than uh, outwardly from an internal process point of view? I think you got, it's, it's a very good question, Mike. And, you know, we if, if I re reflect back in uh, December when we had the opportunity for about two days to sell tickets um, to both football and to rugby, so we, we, we were told that we we're in um, tier two, whatever it was, at back in December. Um, so we had the ability to do 2,000 um, season card holders. And, you know, we, we sort of sat back going, brilliant. We're going to, you know, at least we'll get some sort of crowds. And how are we going to do this? And we spent a few days just trying to understand how we're going to deal with the demand. The demand wasn't 100% there. So it, which illustrates, and anecdotally, we're hearing from fans. We don't know who want to come back. And this was obviously pre pre vaccine, so so there was a bit of concern there. But I tell you what, it's, it certainly didn't just even just a two thousand, considering we have you know, twenty odd thousand um, combined cards. So it, it just I think that illustrates that not everybody will feel comfortable to come back. So you, you have to get that confidence. I think both as George and, and Robert both said, we, we have to be able to be prepared, be absolutely prepared, but also put some onus back on on the consumer, put some onus back on the fan. From our point of view, we're going to go on season um, card sales probably just before April. And we're hoping then we'll have more of an insight um, into what the future looks like and, and a few more, you know, at least one more government announcement. I think you have to illustrate there's going to be some changes. Nobody wants queues. You know, we, we, we can't, we just, we can't de deal with the queues. Also, it's a safety risk. But if we can have the technology in place, and we, again, as I said, we're, we're blessed that we've got a, a fairly modern stadium where turnstiles are already pretty quick and we have long long bars and we have the, the toilets and logistics to be able to deal with it but you have to get that confidence you have to illustrate that confidence um I'm, you know if we don't it, there'll be images and and photographs online fairly quickly i think that the fan and consumer will hold us to account very quickly if they see something they're not comfortable with and that could be reputation ruining you know very, very quickly so we, we do we, we have to be able to illustrate that confidence um through everything that we're doing behind the scenes and George, from, from your perspective there, um, with Ascot having, uh, I, I guess, a slightly different event profile um, to, to that of a, of a conventional sort of football or, or, or rugby stadium there, how do you, uh, how do you deliver some of that, uh, that confidence from a consumer point of view when, when there's a big ramp up to, to a major event uh, versus kind of a, a, a slower and steadier effect, I guess? Well, I think I, I do agree with what Mark and Robert have already said. I think um, it's all going to be it's going to be about building trust. I'm, I, I take the approach and everything I've done uh, in terms of tech and stadium and venues in, in my career. It's always about understanding it from both sides, not just from what my business requires, but also what the customer expectation might be and what I would expect as a customer if I, I came to that venue. OK. Um, the unique thing about lockdown is that we've all experienced it, okay? We all understand what those restrictions mean in different sectors. Um, so it's going to be about building trust during a time which is going to be continually evolving. And there's going to be rules and regulations which we have now, which will change again before we reach the whatever the end point is going to be. So I think really, can fans feel confident that the physical locations like stadiums, race courses, arenas 
are safe for them to return to. That's going to be really important. So you need to engage their trust before you start um, pushing out rules and regulations that they need to follow. Uh, and I guess we need to convince them that their general, just their general emotional and societal needs are being considered. Um, that decisions aren't being made purely from our economic and financial interests, but also theirs. Uh, and then also part of this um, evolving tech stream of uh, and deployment is going to be about data, right? So what we also need to assure them is that any of that data that we need to take as part of a mechanism, whether it's a digital ticket, whether it's sign up to an app, whatever it is, we need to make them feel confident that that information is secure. Um, so there's a, there's a number of mechanisms we have to think about before we even invite them back into place, I think. Uh, and then and, and just picking up on Mark's point as well, I still wonder, um, I think there'll be an initial surge of interest because people just w will want to get out again. But I still wonder whether um, a year in lockdown, a year of um, experiencing your sport in a different way, is going to see a slightly more evolved consumer. And you may have people that don't want to come back to the venue. Okay? And then you have to think about tech initiatives that will allow you to engage with them because they still remain your customer, even if they don't want to come on, on site anymore. Mike, if I can come in there, I absolutely. Um, and I think the biggest risk in, in sport, especially football and rugby, is the grassroots. It, it's the the habits that start at seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 year olds who, who come to the stadium with, with their parent and experience that atmosphere around the stadium. They haven't had that for a year. And, you know, I look at my own kids now who tradition, traditionally would have come to most games. The, the, their lack of interest, the lack of engagement in any sport, also just grassroots because they haven't been able to play themselves, both of whom are quite sporty. And, you know, there's a risk there for missing generation of fans coming through who, are already heavily digitalized, already heavily spending time in front of a screen. Um, and we, look, that, that's one of our key focuses is actually that seven to 12 year old uh, for both, both sports, football and rugby, to make sure we can re-engage with them, to make sure we have been engaging with them and to get, you know, to, to really get them guys back in the first instance and do something slightly different to them. That, that is the conveyor belt of the future. And if, if we miss that conveyor belt, you're going to have a gap. But I also agree that, you know, people's habits have changed. They, and, we're absolutely expecting that the first or second game and uplift, but I think the proof would be the pudding to how many people commit to a season card, spending their 500, 700 thousand pound on the risk that it might get cancelled, or actually just say we might just buy it as we go. And people have traditionally bought season cards because they want to seat where they've always sat, they want to sit beside the people they've always sat with, and, and they want to keep that tradition. They don't want anybody else taking their seat. And and I just wonder, especially in football, how. Um, how that tribal passion will will recover. Um, yeah, we're very very curious how that will look. I think. Uh, I think uh, go on, Robert. Sorry. All right. Okay. No, I think I think the two guys have reversed into what is going to be the nub um, of the of the the issue for all of us, which is, um, you know, for the last year year and a half now, we've all accepted now the fact that you got to wear a mask. We've all accepted the fact you've got to wash your hands. We've all accepted the fact that you've got to stay a couple of meters apart. All of us would agree, uh, so I certainly, and I have five businesses on the campus here, including a sports franchise. And, you know, um, all of us would agree that, you know, commercially social distancing doesn't work for the business. So any, any, any corruption or, or, or de-escalation of social distancing has to be factored into George's point of phasing and taking people back. So you're going to have a period. Yes, I do agree with Mark that you're going to have initial spikes, but I'm not so sure that those spikes would be good for the business because I think one of the practicalities that we have to face to regain trust is that we actually measure our phasing right from day one and actually create nearly like a reverse demand by saying, no, 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 we're only going to take 2,000 people and 1,000 of those are season ticket holders because they've been essentially with us for a period of time. And as we see, as we can touch and feel the reality of what the scenario is, then, then we can start to release the capacity, the capacity buttons on. I think it would be a huge mistake if collectively we all sort of ran to the notion of everybody wanting to break out of the house. They've been saving money for a year. They haven't spent their normal money. They're going to have money to spend. But the reality of it is, if we get it wrong in the first two weeks, it could take us another year to rebuild the trust. And I would be very much advocating going back to the phasing position, saying, okay, look, 
you've had nothing for a year. A little bit of this safe is much, much better than just opening the doors and let everybody come in. And before you know it, you're in lockdown again. So I would absolutely advocate phasing as a first start and not react to the latent demand that people have out there to get back. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Robert. And it's it's a great time to bring in uh, Matt Roberts from uh, from Formula One. Welcome, uh, welcome, Matt. Uh, obviously, you've got a slightly um, uh, a different lens to, to most in that you're on the research and insights uh, side of the business. So, what what have you been learning from from your experience of going out and, and listening to the fans and and querying that? What is what is your data telling you about exactly the points the guys have just been making? Yeah, uh, first of all, apologies for my uh, tech problems, but I'm great to be here and, and just listen to some of those really interesting points that you guys are making. Um, yeah, I mean, what we've learned probably from a, from an F1 point of view, um, and we've been tracking essentially over the last year, but every three months we've been doing a, a kind of returning to racing survey amongst fans to understand the desire to return. And whilst, <clears throat> excuse me, whilst back earlier last year, uh, around you know June time, there was a, a massive reticence to come back. Um, you know, of our, more than fifty percent saying they wouldn't be comfortable coming back. We found that that number has become much less now, and and there's a good sort of seventy percent or so of fans who say the minute they can, they'll be back if as as long as you know the social protocols are in place. Um, actually, weirdly, amongst that kind of seventy percent, there's about half of them who literally don't care about the social protocols. Whatever we do, they'll be back. And um, but then the other half it is about the safety measures in place, social distancing, masks, uh, uh, and, and all that kind of stuff to to get those guys back. And then there's that kind of thirty percent that are stubbornly not moving, and they're the group of people that we need to coerce back because they're saying in the surveys nonstop, "I'm not happy. I don't feel safe. I don't feel safe." So for us, that's the challenge: is getting those people back and understand understanding what do we need to do. Um, to get those people back. I think one thing that's been interesting is the increased desire in hospitality. So the kind of, you know, the, the ARPU that we can get from our spectators could go up because uh, as Robert said, they saved a lot of money. And when they do come back, they may well go, well, why don't we buy hospitality at Silverstone rather than general admission? Because we can treat ourselves and then we feel safer because we've got more space around us and, and we get a better ticket. So we're finding that kind of movement. Um, but also finding that just general behaviours, you know, the UK is a, is a country of, um, of, of forward booking, you know, I think a majority of Silverstone tickets are sold within seven days of the previous event taking place. Uh, that obviously isn't happening now and people are waiting till very much that last minute um, to make those decisions or, or they're claiming they're going to wait till the last minute because they don't want to be disappointed again. We've had a year of disappointments of booking things and then those things being cancelled, you know, holidays, shows, events, sports events, uh, all being then being postponed or cancelled. So we're finding a lot of that kind of last minute behaviour. And that's slightly concerning our race promoters because they're used to this forward booking. Yet they're coming to us saying, people aren't booking in advance anymore. What, what can we do? And we, we say, you know, that patience needs to be there because people will come back. It's just that that change in behavior that we've seen so they're kind of like the, the themes we've seen on a, on a very macro level um we've been tracking consumer confidence via ipsos um and we've seen that it was coming back around sort of november time it's dipped again during this lockdown um but month for month that consumer confidence has increased again so uh with the vaccination programs we should see that number going higher and higher hopefully as we go into the summer but we're still I mean, I'm looking at the report now as I speak to you. I think we're still five percentage points down on where we were last February in terms of overall consumer confidence. Whilst if you look at somewhere like Australia or China, they're both up six or seven percent year on year. So the UK is, is some way behind. How do we think as a group that that last minute planning effect uh, will influence operations, really, and some of those challenges from a venue perspective, you know, be it as simple as ordering from a different B point of view and, uh, and the catering side of the businesses in, in, to stewards and safety and security. Uh, how much is that influencing your guys' thinking? Um, F1, um, or, or generally. Uh, I think um, for us, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it's having a big impact because obviously before we, you know, again, I'm, I don't want to speak out of turn because I'm the research guy. I'm not the guy who, who does that, that booking, but 
sort of from what I've heard internally is it it's just making it very hard to understand how many staff we need on the ground. Um, it's making it hard to understand kind of um, where we put things like our F&B, our merchandise stands. Um, we've always noticed we do this piece of work with a company called Mesh where we track fans around the circuit. So we have sensors placed around the circuit and we know exactly where fans are moving around and how many fans there are at different times in different parts of the circuit. So we know exactly where our food and drinks should go, where our merchandise should go to maximize that commercial return. I guess the, the thing is now all that behavior is out of the window. So we just don't know how those fans are behaving or how they will behave when they come back. Will they go to the fan zones or will they stay away if they're a bit too busy? Um, or so therefore, should we spread the food and drink beverages somewhere else or should we have um, you know, food villages or whatever? Um, so we're finding it generally on, on that side, that kind of organizational side, very much harder to plan based on legacy of what we've known before. Um, I kind of, it's hard for me to say what that means operationally. And I'm sure the guys will be able to jump in on that in terms of ordering things in because that's kind of the job of our race promoters. But I just know that we're finding it a bit harder to just work off of previous research and previous analysis. And this year will be kind of year zero again, I think. I think that's a very good point, Matt. Um, I think that um, I think there's been a general acceptance across the board now that what we left, we aren't going back to. Um, and I think the other thing that it has done is it has ruthlessly exposed um, the, 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 the sort of perception of risk that we've always taken for granted before the pandemic, but now we're looking at primary and secondary risks where we're basically saying, okay, if you're looking at a, an indoor arena with you know, 12,000 seats and the arena and the band get paid and it's the promoter that has to take all the risks. Um, and then you look at that scenario then where, okay, your rent from that promoter might balance your costs, your profits coming from your secondary sales of F&B and your merch dividends and your tickets off sales and all that good stuff. So I think that there's another conversation that needs to happen as well around the whole appetite and attitude of risk within both the primary and the secondary markets of any uh, event or any um, uh, sort of uh, location. Because as, as, as Matt rightly says, um, you can predict as much as you like and there could be a bounce back where people want to spend money, but the experience has to be, in my opinion, heightened beyond what we've ever got away with before. Because I think people are now gonna be so used to not having to do that, that their tolerance will have fallen through the floor. So when they arrive at the place for whatever it is they pay, it has to be on the money, right down the line. I'd agree with that. I think if we feel that we can get away doing the same things we've always done before, uh, we're, we're sorely mistaken. Um, I think we 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 do we do need to to kind of reinvent things and, and not uh, repeat the patterns of the past. Um, and I also don't think we should be afraid of engagement with with people that that, that are at home more. I mean, last year Asker Royal Ascot ran behind closed doors, but we utilised our our NFC asset, which was built okay to allow entry to the venue, but we utilised that as a as a competition mechanism. So that we could actually send it out to people at home, uh, we we got thousands of new signups that way, just by looking at a traditional entry model and then repurposing repurposing it for for our, our customers at home. And the Ascot Golden Ticket campaign was one of the most successful things we did last year. It's all about looking at um, um, the the future, but in a different way. Um, and, and that's where you know it comes back to also understanding your customer. And I think you know. If you understand yourself as a customer, that's going to help in terms of what you do for preparation. George, just to follow on on that, so we just had a we just had a question uh, come through uh, from from Thorsten from Luton Town Football Club, uh, who asks a uh, general question: that GDPR was a huge hurdle for this uh, type of activity before COVID, but now that we've seen the introduction of track and trace uh, and wider items uh, like that. It appears that this may have taken a bit more of a back seat. How do we how do we collectively see um, that challenge being dealt with as we as we reopen and as uh, Robert uh, alluded to earlier, need to potentially collect more data um, from, a, from a consumer. And George, you were alluding to there, using it from a 
uh, from a capital point of view. Uh, sorry, go on, Robert. Well, I'm in the, I think in the first case, um, such are going to be the vagaries with GDPR, especially around issues as personal as health, that we're going to have to all find a way to put the emphasis on that, on the protection and ownership of that GDPR back to the customer. I don't think there's any set of circumstances where we would start collecting data around the, the notion of health. And if you, if you think about the simplicity of the vaccination rollout, it's been done by the NHS. The NHS are running on the biggest data bank that's ever been created in real terms in this country. And the, the most successful operators will be the ones that can translate the communication between the NHS and the customer onto a bolt-on of an app that makes the customer responsible for delivering their health passport into your app. And that means that the, the, third, part, the third party covers in place and therefore you don't need GDPR. Yeah, I think that I, I would agree with Robert actually there. Um, I mean, there, there is still going to be the perception um, from a lot of people that we are taking data or we're harvesting data for other reasons. OK, uh, but we need to be clear about what data we are uh, we are looking to, to take and why we're taking it. And I think the health element needs to kind of be separate from that in, in many respects. Um, yeah, I would, uh, I would tend to agree from a, from a DPO standpoint that there, there are two different ways of looking at things. And, uh, and equally, it comes back to points that we, we've all made at various points uh, across this, which is that we need to build consumer trust through clear and sort of open communication. If we can tell them why and how we're using things and what for what purposes, and where that line of delineation splits between health and getting into the building versus uh, us understanding their behaviours and their marketing to, to an extent, that's going to be a key piece of it. And just as we start to, to look to, to wind up on this session, uh, I'd just like to take the chance to ask each of you, um, you know, as you as you head towards your respective reopenings, what's the what's the one key thing that you've got in mind uh, that the um, audience today should be should be thinking about uh, as well? Uh, Matt, if I could if I can start off with you. Sorry, I'm on mute. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. It's a tough one. You've gone to me first. I was going to, how, how you went something else. But basically, um, I mean, there's the, I wouldn't say it's just one thing um, for us. Um, uh, I mean, we as a business, as we've all alluded to, we're learning and, and this will be like a bit of a year zero for us. Um, I think um, we're going to probably need to make changes as the season goes by and, 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 and keep, continue to track um, sort of the response of our fans and, and the return to races to understand um, what what we can do to kind of enhance their experience and make those who aren't coming back feel safer. Um, I guess based on um, uh, I think um, what what George said, um, we we've kind of used this also as a um, an opportunity to to allow the fans to see that there are other elements other than just coming back to events. So we've created like a virtual series where we have drivers um, racing amongst everyday people on, on our, our F1 game. Um, that has been hugely successful. We've got our um, virtual paddock club hospitality now, which we did initially and we had no fans. And now, um, as George said, that's something that that's a fixture that's going to stay now. Uh, we've got a sponsor in Zoom. Um, and uh, so I think for fans, that just... Uh, yeah, the one thing for them to take away from us is that we are we are constantly trying to evolve to um, make sure we uh, are a safe environment for them and that we um, we try and adhere to their needs and, and their requirements, whether it be at races, but also at home in terms of enhancing that experience for them. Robert, from your side. Great question, Mike. Um, <laughs> You know, I think, I think, um, I do absolutely agree with Matt that, um, you know, safe is going to be the currency. I think the huge frustration I've had, I've, as Katie alluded to at the start, I've spent a couple of months lobbying in Europe and in the European Parliament to try and see if we could get some sense of joined up thinking around how the, the noisemakers in Parliament are going to actually interface with the, the people on the ground. And I think if, for me, um, a greater awareness of what all of the, of what we do for a living 
uh, at government level and a greater understanding of some of the um, uh, self-help initiatives that we can bring to the table that will bypass a lot of the bureaucracy that they're eventually going to bring to space data uh, would be a start. So I'd like to see a much, much more open conversation with government, uh, both in the UK, uh, uh, you know, post-Brexit and across in Europe, where they start to understand and complement the scale and significance of the impact uh, of COVID and that they start to, um, to understand that none of us are coming back as heroes. We've, come, we've got to all come back in baby steps. And George and Mark, a quick bullet point from you before I uh, overlap our session and uh, see the start of the next one. Well, I, I think that, you know, everybody's mentioned it being a ground zero moment. So for me, that just represents opportunity. We can be smart, we can rethink, um, but, but and make our customers feel like they're part of the story. People like to be to feel like they're part of this journey, part of this story. Um, and, and I think that uh, we shouldn't be afraid to utilize tech to kind of create a narrative an interaction and a content companion piece. So that as we start to phase the return of customers to to our venues and our sites, they feel that they're coming along that journey with us. Mark, last but not least. Very, very quickly. Look, I think everybody has um, stopped matter from a, from a fan, consumer, customer point of view. I think, and I agree with what everybody said. I think, from from my point of view, also alongside that, we have to look at the commercials. And I think, you know, a, a big focus for, for me is to ensure that we have fluidity in our business. You know, we, we've we're all used to in events by ramping up and ramping down and, and having that casual workforce and, and those casual cost base. But I think we need to um, ensure that we have a huge amount more fluidity. In our business to be able to react to perhaps two or three four weeks lockdowns over the next you know 12 months we nobody knows what the autumn is going to bring so to have that level of fluidity um within alongside what my colleagues have said on this but having that fluidity in, in the actual business to make sure the businesses survive that's great well mark george roberts matt thanks very much for for joining today thanks for the insights uh, i hope everyone enjoyed the panel uh, and continue to enjoy the rest of the uh, ALSD uh, and the next sessions. Uh, thanks for joining, and I will hand back to Katie. Hi, guys. Thank you very much for that panel. It was uh, very uh, informative. I'm sure we could have gone on a lot longer as well, but I know a lot of you are joining us um, in Liverpool um, at Anfield this September, so uh, we can go into more details then. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.